So good morning, everybody, and it is a privilege. It really is, because it's obviously you don't see me here up here that often, um, but when I do, it really is a, an honor, because, I mean, one of the things that I constantly pray before I come up on the stage is, God, what is it that you want me to say? What is it that you want me to del- deliver? Because ultimately, I am just a vessel. And I just keep telling myself over and over and over again, I'm just a vessel, I'm just a vessel, I'm just a vessel. I don't want anything that I want to say to come out. Um, and that goes into to heavy prayer. And I start off with that because prior to coming or doing this message today, I was trying to come up with just about every excuse in the book on why I should not be up here preaching today. Uh, and I'm serious when I say that, that it's not because I'm nervous, and that's probably a little bit of a lie. I mean, I do have some nerves. And, and it's not because I didn't think I had something to say. But when I told Matt that I wanted to preach this message several weeks ago, I, I was excited because I thought it would be awesome to share my story again and how I needed God or how I figured that out. And I could be able to tell others on how they need God too. And and be able to share my experiences, and be able to give you some scriptures to support my message, and hope that you see what I experienced, and hope that you'd be ready to make some changes. And that's when I realized, and I apologize, I don't mean to use this word to offend anybody, but when I started realizing that this was the type of message that I needed to deliver, the first word that came to mind was crap. I'm like, (laughs) I'm not ready to preach this message. And when I thought about that, I immediately started evaluating my life. You know, when I started looking at my life, I think overall, I have a pretty healthy marriage. I have three healthy, beautiful baby girls. I have a beautiful home. I have the truck that I've always wanted. Um, I have money in my bank account. Those who know me, I'm an Apple fanatic. So I have just about every Apple device tablet that is out there. I have my PlayStation 4, I have a great job, make decent money, I have the opportunity to coach the sport that I absolutely love, which is volleyball, I eat out whenever I want, my family, I would say, we have pretty good Christmases and holidays, Um, overall, I would say, I think I have it pretty good, and I'm not saying that it's bad or even wrong to have these things, because I'm sure like you, I mean, you have worked for some of the things that you've wanted. And maybe some of you right now are like, I'm not really connecting. I'm not really seeing what the problem is. At least for me, the problem is these things that I've mentioned have taken a priority over what it is that I believe. They've taken a priority on how I believe God has called me to live. I started reflecting on how I'm living my life and how it's contrary to the way God has called me to live my life and lead and how I'm supposed to be leading my family. And I kept telling myself, I can't preach this message because intellectually, I know. I know that I need God. I mean, that's why we were doing this whole series, Who Needs God? I believe Pastor Matt, week one of this series, Who Needs God? And everybody chuckled and was raising their hand. We do, we do. We all, intellectually, we all know that we need God. But if I'm truthful to myself, I'm not living the way that I ought to live. I'm living too comfortably and securely in this world. Now, I could preach a normal message up here, and because most of you know me, most of you trust me, and for the most part that you see me as a pastor, you wouldn't second guess, for the most part, if I were to come up here on any given Sunday and deliver a message. And so the reason I'm having a hard time with preaching this message was because it's because of what I'm wrestling with in the inside. Very well, very well knowing that I'm not taking my relationship with God as seriously as I ought. And I know the scripture very well, James 3.1. It says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. And I didn't want to come up here this morning and be a hypocrite. Or even, maybe worse, preach a message and then for somebody to call me out Later on, for living a life contrary to what I taught from this stage. So, I say all this at the risk 
of ruining the series right here at the end. (laughs) And at the risk of possibly offending some of you all, which I certainly don't intend to do, at the risk of putting myself out there and you learning some things about me, instead of me telling you why you need God, I'm going to tell you why I desperately need God. And maybe some things will make sense to you. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you, can, you will feel led at the end to make some changes in your own life as well. And for what it's worth, I don't believe me being up here today is a mistake. I believe God knew exactly what he was doing when I first decided that I wanted to tackle this message. He allowed me through this process and through prayer and research and reading, he allowed me to do some internal reflection so that I could see where I needed to make some changes in my life so that I could, and use a churchy word here, so I could repent of my sins. That would ultimately, so that ultimately I would live for him and not for myself. Again, if I can be truly honest with myself. If you want to take your Bibles out, uh, we're going to spend a lot of time in, uh, most of the time I should say, in the book of Revelation in chapter 3 starting at verse 14. And I'll give you a second to get there while I'm kind of giving you some context of where we're going. But when I was reading this chapter, some of you have known or understand the phrase lukewarm. It's a term that Jesus used to describe those that attended a church of Laodicea. And like other churches written in the book of Revelation, Jesus had nothing, and I mean nothing good, to say about this church. In fact, when you research this church, it very much looks like churches that you see today, especially here in America, that are very lukewarm, that are not taking the message of Christ very seriously. And the Apostle John goes on to write, starting in verse 14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, and he starts off with saying, these are the words of the Amen. And I love how he starts there. These are the words of the amen. So you know right here, right now, we are talking about these are the words. This is what Jesus Christ wants to tell this church. He is the amen. So he says, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. The idea of being lukewarm in this sense is that I am ultimately unable to decide between God and what we have tangible in our hands. A good illustration of this is in Mark 10, and Jesus, he's going over the parable of the rich and talking about the rich in the kingdom of God. And he says in Mark 10, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him, a guy who knew who Jesus was, and said to him, good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit the eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, I have these, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Don't do sight of that. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Because there are times when you have people who love you will point you in the right direction no matter how hard it hurts. And he says to him, Jesus, one thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And at this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. It's also, if, I, if you're familiar with the parable of the hidden treasure, 
What I'm trying to get at is almost like if I were to rewrite that parable and say, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in the field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then he contemplated on whether he should sell everything he has to purchase this field or keep his possession to save for some earthly purpose. And in case you don't know how that actual parable goes, it says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy sold all sold everything that he had and he bought that field and the truth of the matter is i and i'm talking again myself here i see how precious treasure like god is and how much i want to do or how much i want to spend eternity with him how god has been so patient with me and that he covers me with his grace but and that is an ugly but that word i'm talking about Following what I just said about God, that I love the comfort and the security of my life. Even though I don't go around saying how much I love myself, I don't go around boasting with what I have. But my actions, my bank account, my lifestyle, my choices ultimately would say, say otherwise. And the hardest pill that I had to swallow when reading Revelation 3 was more specifically to the lukewarm when Jesus said, I know your deeds. I know you better than you know you. You can't hide anything from me. You can't fake this. That you are neither hot or cold. I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, Francis Chan, uh, he's a pastor author, and he has an incredible book out that's called Crazy Love. And specifically in chapter 4, he challenges his readers to think about our walk with God and whether or not we are truly devoted to him. Francis says that a relationship with God simply cannot grow when money, sins, activities, favorite sports teams, addictions, or commitments are piled on top of it. So basically, if it's more important than God, it's a bad thing. And in this chapter, he lists out some of the lukewarm behaviors, the ones that, and the ones that I'm going to read to you are the ones that I know that I personally have or currently struggle with. He defines lukewarm as this. Lukewarm people attend church regularly. It's what good Christians do. Lukewarm people give money to church as long as it doesn't impinge on their standard of living. Lukewarm people really don't want to be saved from their sin. They only want to be saved from the penalty of their sin. Lukewarm people rarely share their faith with their neighbors, co-workers, or friends. Lukewarm people say that they love Jesus, and indeed, that Jesus is a part of their lives, but only a part. They give them a second of their time, money, and their thoughts, but he isn't allowed to control their lives. Lukewarm people love others, but do not seek to love others as much as they love themselves. Lukewarm people will serve God and others, but there are limits to how far they will go or how much time, money, and energy that they are willing to give. Lukewarm people think about life on earth much more than eternity in heaven. Lukewarm people do not live by faith, Their lives are structured so they don't have to. Lukewarm people probably drink and swear less than average, but besides that, they really aren't very different from your typical unbeliever. And here again is that pill that was hard for me to swallow. I used to understand this lukewarm term as, and some of you may have heard this, as lukewarm Christian. A believer who is living just as I described, but when you really, and I mean when you really take a look, at what Jesus is talking about in Revelation 3. In verse 17, he says, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And when I read this, this ultimately does not sound like a believer in Jesus Christ. If anything, it sounds like someone who doesn't know the Lord at all. And Jesus, going back to this, He's addressing a church when he's saying this. 
And when I read this, and I promise you, I'm telling you the truth, I had to ask myself, will I be one of these people that Jesus says in Matthew 7, not every one of you that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I certainly hope not. But if I don't think the kingdom of God is worth more than anything that I have here on earth to include my wife and my daughters, then I am probably deceiving myself and where I will end up when I die. And I certainly, certainly don't say that lightly. And maybe some of you are thinking, this dude is crazy. <laughs> I mean, to take an extreme position on how I view my relationship with God or lack thereof. The problem is, I don't know how else to read scripture like Revelation 3 or any other scripture where Jesus is very clear on how serious that we are, that I am supposed to take my relationship with him, with God. I need to make a decision because staying safely and comfortably in the middle isn't an option. To say I'm all in simply means I do not care about my possessions on earth more than the kingdom of God. It means I will gladly give up anything and everything I have for God. It means that I will be on fire for God. It means that I will accept his will for my life and I will submit to the way he wants me to live. And to say anything less than this, I believe, I would be saying to myself and to God, I'm currently not interested in being in a relationship with you. And I think that's ultimately what Jesus is saying, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. Jesus wants me. He wants you. He wants all of us to be all in for him. And I will be even bold enough to say, or all out. So let me be clear on this all out. And I want that to be misunderstood. What I mean by that is if I'm not ready to take my relationship with Jesus seriously, then don't enter into an emotional response type decision to accept him. I have to. We all do. We have to count. There's a reason it's in scripture. We have to count the costs of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. If someone new is to accepting Christ, we understand there's going to be a lot of growth and maturing during the early stages of their walk. But as their relationship with Christ matures, so should their commitment of following Christ's teachings and commands. My all-out comment is more for, number one, myself. And also for those who have been in a relationship with Jesus and they realize, because it really has to be a you decision, have been living contrary to the way that you ought to live. Now, Pastor Matt mentioned at the beginning of this series um, that at our church, you can belong to this church before you can believe. And when I say belong, I mean you can come in here and you can get involved and, when, and you can get into life groups. In fact, you can even serve in some capacity here. Um, and the reason we do this, the reason we've embraced this idea is because we know that when Jesus was here, it's in the scripture, that he, when he invited people to follow him, they didn't f- believe right away. In fact, his followers, in some cases, were worse than us because they believed, then they didn't, excuse me, they didn't believe, and then they believed. Um, then they didn't know what to believe after he had died. And then when he rose from the dead, they believed again, And then ultimately, they changed the world. So if you've ever believed, if you've ever stopped believing, if you're someone who has struggled with your faith, and you're reconsidering it, well, guess what? You're in. You fit the description or criteria for somebody who followed Jesus in the first century. And so as his body, we dare not say that you cannot belong here until you believe. So now what? Sometimes when faced with weighted decisions, you have to go back to the passions that you first had however long ago, and you have to be able to feel what it was that led you to make that decision in the first place. Some of you guys know this, back in 2006 when I was in Iraq, uh, that's where I was led to the Lord, and ultimately that's where I was baptized. And I will never, 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 ever forget the feeling of raising my hand for the first time after months of ignoring the call to accept Christ. I will never forget the most purest 
feeling in the world when I had an opportunity in a pool there on that base in Iraq to get baptized. When I was lifted out of that water, it was this incredible feeling. I will never forget Chaplain Jason Peters who befriended me when I felt lost over there spiritually and worked with me to build a spiritual foundation for me to take back to the States here. I will never forget the feeling of praying for the first time in a church service and feeling God's peace and his comfort over me. And I could go on and on and on where I could see God actively working in my life prior to when I accepted Christ to ultimately get me to where I am today. When God said in 1 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone, anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And looking back, I can see how God has been so patient in my life. I can see where he wants to have a relationship with me. In fact, the Apostle Paul said it perfectly in Romans 5, 8. And he says, and there's this phrase that we miss sometimes. Paul said this. He says, for God, in 5, 8, demonstrates, demonstrates, demonstrates. For God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I didn't, I have even asked myself this question. Again, I'm just, I'm being transparent with you guys. If there is a God, why didn't God just forgive everybody? Why all the blood? Why all the gore? Why did somebody have to die? Why didn't God just say, you're all forgiven? And I finally found the answer to that question. And the bottom line is because God wanted wanted to enter into a relationship with mankind. The bottom line is that you cannot have a relationship with someone you do not sacrifice for. If you do not sacrifice for me, then I do not know that you love me. And listen to this because this is powerful right here. Because ultimately this is the gospel. This is right at the epicenter of everything that we believe as Christians. God demonstrated his love for you he touched down to enter into relationship with mankind and every relationship demands a sacrifice every offense requires forgiveness every offense requires coming back together in restitution and through christ this is why it's the grand narrative it's the perfect story it's why all the evidence points to the fact that this is actually the stream in which we live that through christ God demonstrated both his forgiveness and his restitution. And I ask myself this question, do I really want to live outside of that? God sacrificed, God sacrificed, God sacrificed his son for me, for you. He demonstrated, do I really want to treasure my time on earth more than the internal riches, righteousness, and a relationship with our heavenly father? This book, this Bible, when you look at it from the perspective of a father watching over his children, do you, you really do see how this is the greatest love story that was ever written. And you may feel that when reading that there are so many rules and things that you can't do with anymore or things that you can't do. But if I seriously ask myself this question, if I had written this book, for my three little girls, and I think you would say the same thing. There are things in this book that you would not want your children doing. One of my favorite scriptures comes from Hebrews 10, 24, and it says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And I love this concept of sometimes needing to be pierced, sometimes that we need to be pricked by God or another Christian so whatever sin I am doing is corrected. So that I may, for me personally, so that I may stay on course. And this is how Revelation 3 finishes out, if you're still following at verse 19. Jesus says, those whom I love, I rebuke in discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. 
and eat with that person, and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And what's so special about verse 21, it says that I will give you the right to sit with me on my throne. And what's so special is that you have in the very next chapter, so it ends here in verse chapter 3, in the very next chapter, chapter 4, the Apostle John is given this vision, and he is invited to see exactly the throne of heaven. John says, day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so I had to ask myself again, as I'm going through all of this, do I really want to live myself outside of that? Can I really, I mean really, 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 can I really look at everything, everything that God has done for me and say, the way I live my life, the possessions that I have, where I put my time, where I put my energy is more important than you, God. I can't. I can't. I, I, I cannot say that. And in a second, I'm going to have a song played here. And it's called So I Will. And when you listen and you watch the lyrics and you allow the lyrics to sink into your heart, the song is absolutely breathtaking. Because this song goes full circle from creation all the way to salvation. One of the lyrics say, if creation will sing, if the wind goes where you will, send it, so will I. Feel free while the song is playing to either sit and reflect or stand, whatever it is that you feel you need to do or are called to do. And this is ultimately what I'm asking you to do. I ask that if there is any part of you that resonates with any part of my message this morning, I want you to take time this morning, and while the song is being played, I want you to ask some of the same questions I asked myself. The first question is, God, show me where I am lukewarm. The second question is, God, give me strength to overcome those weaknesses and the third question is God do whatever it takes and mean it to get me on fire for you now again and part of me just being very transparent and vulnerable with you today um, I'm honored that the fact that God allows me to feel and see what I need to to feel and see um I'm going to ask Pastor Matt to come up here. I'm going to ask uh, anyone else who may be on our uh, prayer team to come up here. I'm going to ask if any of our other pastoral staff wants to come up here. And this is a very long, reflective song here. Um, if there is anything, as this song is playing, and I mean anything that you need prayer for, I ask that you just come up here and we will pray for you. If there's a rededication that you feel like you need to recommit to God, to Jesus. I ask that you come up here and let's pray. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you would love to make that decision or you would just love to know what is this, Jesus, come up here and let's pray. I hope you haven't, well, first let me put it this way. I, I hope in saying this that none of you are offended with anything um, or haven't insulted anybody and certainly hope you don't think too much less of me for being up here um, but our faith is so important our relationship with God is so important and like I said when I read Revelations 3 I can't take it any other way for myself to realize I'm not living the way I ought to live and so while this song is playing I will be down here praying and asking for that recommitment of, God, I need to be on more fire for you. I need to be passionate for you. And I thank you, Father, for having that much love to say, you know what? I will not leave you the way you are. Yes, I love you. 
but I love you too much to leave you the way you are. So I'm going to pray, and then, this, and then you'll see this song here. Father, just, again, we come here this morning um, out of respect and awe for you and everything that you have truly done. Father, everything that you have given us. And as, even as Pastor Matt said during the offering, everything that we have, Father, was yours, is yours. Um, and you just, you allow us to have what you want us to have. Uh, and Father, there are times that we truthfully, even myself, uh, take advantage of that. And, and so, Father, I just, that's where I come to you asking for that forgiveness. Father, I just, I ask for your forgiveness that I have not living the way that I know that you have called me to live. Father, I ask for that forgiveness of knowing that I have put my things here on earth ahead of you. I have chosen to go seek those things than to seek what it is that you have or have called me to do. So, Father, I just ask in this room that if there are any others that are feeling exactly the same way or can understand where it is that I'm coming from or understand what you have called us to do, Father, I ask that you just stir that spirit inside them and allow them to come forward so that we can pray and pray for what it is that you are calling us to do so that we can be extremely passionate for you, Father, that you can show us where in our lives we may be lukewarm, where we need to ask for that strength to overcome any weakness that we may have, to be able to ask, Father, for you to fill us up so that we may be on fire for what it is that you have us to do, Father. Father, we humbly come to you this morning, humbly, before your throne. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.